he is. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. I can see attendees beginning to join us now. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. We are excited to be hosting Robert Reich, presenting his new book, The System, Who Rigged It, How We Fix It. He's gonna be talking with Anand Gir Girdardas, so you're in for an excellent time. Um, tonight's event was originally scheduled to take place at St. Joseph's College as part of our Brooklyn Voices series. So we salute our partners at St. Joseph's in absentia and we're glad you are all able to gather here. Um, before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Robert and Anand and everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Um, Greenlight's bookstore storefronts are currently closed and locked, um, but our community is still here. So we're really grateful to be able to stay connected through events like these. Um, as before we officially begin, just a couple little housekeeping things to get oriented to the sort of Zoom interface. If you're logging in, you should be able to see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you, although they can see your names if you're logged in. Um, at the top right of most Zoom displays, you can see an option to toggle between gallery and speaker view. We recommend speaker view so you can focus on the person, but that's up to you. At the bottom of your display, you should see a speech bubble icon labeled chat, which will open up a chat window. For the Q&A portion of tonight's event, um, you can put your questions in that chat throughout the evening and we'll be selecting some to ask for Robert. Um, we'll, we'll close questions about 8.10, so put those in throughout the, throughout the event. You should also see a button at the bottom of that window that says raise hand. Take a moment to find that as we'll be referencing that in a little bit. And then books. Um, Greenlight Bookstore is not currently able to sell books out of our storefronts, but we are filling at greenlightbookstore.com via direct to home shipping from our supplier warehouse. So if you haven't already, you can go ahead and order the system or one of Robert or Anand's other books and support the bookstore and the author. You can find the book buy links right on the event page. It's up on the front at greenlightbookstore.com right now. I'm sorry we're not able to offer signed books tonight, but your support via purchasing a book makes a huge difference for the author and the bookstore and it helps Greenlight have a future. So we're also recording tonight and we hope to post this conversation on our website as of tomorrow. Um, so let me hand you over in a moment to our speakers. Um, our featured author tonight is Robert Reich. He's professor of public policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California in Berkeley. So he's joining us from the West Coast tonight. He has served in three books with um, Anand Girdardas. He is the author of The True American, India Calling, and most recently, Winners Take All, which we're proud to say he launched with Greenlight in September of 2018 as part of the same series. Um, so Anand's going to give a little more of an introduction and let us know what to expect this evening. So Anand, take it away. Thank you. Well, good evening. I'm Anand, um, and my day job is that I am a substitute English teacher and quarantine barber for my children. Um, I am delighted to be in conversation tonight um, with Robert Reich, economist, writer, thinker, champion of working people, uh, former cabinet member, very prestigious. Um, you know, Bob and I have a lot in common. We are both edited uh, by the same extraordinary editor, Jonathan Siegel at Alfred Knopf. Uh, Bob and I also both held important positions in the Clinton administration. Uh, he was labor secretary and I was president of my high school government club. Um, and I just want to say, Bob has really written an incredible book. Uh, the System is uh, a book for everybody who has the questions that I know brought you here tonight, and I still see the numbers rising. Questions like, why do the billionaires always seem to win even when they lose? Uh, why do crises that hurt working people uh, the most lead to changes that hurt working people more? Um, what will it take to end this second Gilded Age? Uh, what will it take to seize on this crisis that we're in at this moment and enact paid sick leave and universal health care and any number of other social policies that will end America's cruelties? Um, and before I ask Bob some questions, we want to try a little experiment today to see who's here, even though we can't physically see you because that would be crazy. Um, I, want to, I want to get a sense of how all of us are showing up to this conversation and to the ideas that, that Bob has to share. So if you can find that participants tab in the bottom, the thing where uh, the numbers are piling up, um, if you click on that, then on the right side of your screen, I think there's this button that says raise hand. 
Um, and I want you to raise your hand for the following questions. And then I, I don't know if you unraise it or you, you'll figure that out as you go um, for each of these. I want you to raise your hand if you have lost your job or lost hours or projects or work in recent weeks because of this crisis. The numbers are still going up. We have, you know, about a fifth of people answering that way. Thank you. Um, how do you, are you unraise your hand or what, we're, all, we're all experimenting here. Um, next question, raise your hand if you are a parent suddenly responsible for teaching a child about the world right now. Again, a lot of you. Um, raise your hand if this crisis has made you rethink something fundamental about how the system works or how it should. Well, that's a lot of people, the most so far. A lot of rethinking, for almost 40, more than 40% of people, 50, 50% 50 of people, I feel like an auctioneer. Um, raise your hand if you found solace in the news in this time. Raise your hand if you felt solace turning away from the news. More people than, than in turning towards it. Um, raise your hand if this crisis has made you already actively get more involved in politics in one way or another, giving money, signing up for things, joining. Again, lots of people. Um, and raise your hand if this crisis, this time that you may have on your hands now, that many of us have on our hands now, has gotten you reading, reading books. Okay, we got a strong showing for books, nice representation for books. We might cross that 50% mark. We did, uh, almost. So I want to talk about Bob's book for a second before we dip into questions, because this kind of book is so important in a time of tweets, right? When you have this kind of story unfolding, I and mean, I, I spend every day on Twitter, those of you who know me, like I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and yet there's so much heat in a place like Twitter in a moment like this, where there's so many deep things going on, and there's just not a lot of depth. And, and Bob's book is extraordinary because it is, like so many books, a digested process. It's someone's best thinking over a period of years applied to these questions. And while I certainly hope Bob did not have advanced notice of the coronavirus pandemic uh, when he was planning his book release, this book is an extraordinary guide to this moment, to the power grabs that are going on, to the opportunities that actually exist right now for progressive egalitarian ideas to prevail, to the possibility that those ideas will absolutely be wiped out by contrary impulses. This book couldn't um, be more important. Um, but I want to start, Bob, by asking you, you know, to actually start with the origin of this book. Because this book has a strange origin that I love so much. Um, so you say something some years ago. I don't know if you said it in an event or you said it in, a, in, in the media. You say something about uh, a famous man, a banker. And you get a call from that fam famous banker man, because that famous banker man is not used to being spoken of unkindly, perhaps. Um, and that phone call and the kind of rich splaining you got from this banker man on the phone um, is sort of the origin of the book. And this book is, is sort of your half of the call delivered a couple of years later. Can you just tell us that, that story? Uh, yes. Uh, and, and also, I want to, before I start, uh, Anand, I want to thank you uh, for both being here tonight, but also for being here for so many people uh, on so many days and and weeks and years. Uh, your books have been absolutely fabulous. Uh, I love Winners Take All. Uh, and when we met, uh, I guess at the Berkeley Book Festival, uh, was it year, one year or two years, my sense of time has completely blown out the window since the coronavirus. Uh, but whenever yes, we did- whenever zoomed we did, as the people. Uh, it was, uh, I, I just felt like there was a kindred spirit. Uh, you know, I was, I, I didn't have to make a case because you knew uh, you had already been making the same case, and you knew where I was coming from. Uh, 
but the question you asked, I also want to thank Jessica and I want to thank uh, Greenlight Bookstore uh, for putting this on. And, and uh, even though you're not open now, uh, in fact, that's even more of a thank you uh, in this time of national crisis and health crisis and coronavirus uh, for doing this. Uh, but Anand, your question, uh, how did this begin? Well, uh, the person who called me in my office at Berkeley one day uh, is, is a guy whose his name is not a household word exactly. It should be. Uh, I wish it would be. The fact that it's not suggests that he is uh, winning in the sense of having probably more power over the economy and our politics than any other single person I know who is not the president of the United States and not a senator. Certainly more power than any member, other member of Congress, uh, House of Representatives. Uh, his name is Jamie Dimon. He is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. It's the largest bank in the United States. He's also the chairman of something called the Business Roundtable, which is a collection of the most powerful CEOs uh, in the United States. Uh, his prowess, his power is expressed behind the scenes for the most part. Uh, he is wheeling and dealing. I saw a little bit of his power when I was uh, Secretary of Labor, but his power really became far more obvious uh, in the early 2000s uh, before the uh, financial crisis. And then after the financial crisis, uh, he led the way toward actually watering down uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was supposed to prevent financial crises again. Uh, he also led the way toward the Trump uh, Republican tax cut of December 2017, uh, which was two point over almost two trillion dollars. In fact, these days we're talking about the gigantic uh, recovery package, or whatever we want to call it, survival package on the coronavirus. That's two point two trillion dollars. Well, people forget that that big Trump Republican tax cut that Jamie Dimon led the way toward. Uh, was two po just about the same amount of money. It was $2 trillion. Uh, but the point is that Jamie Dimon exercises his power indirectly. Uh, he is a major contributor, and he rounds up a lot of money for Democrats as well as Republicans. He calls himself a Democrat, inter interestingly enough, uh, and he has been a major friend uh, to Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Uh, the New York, New York Times described him as the America's favorite banker uh, because he alone, almost among all of the bankers, emerged from the stench of 2008 and the financial collapse, uh, sounding as if he was uh, rather heroic. His bank, uh, it turns out, did not do very heroic things, but he is sort of a master at making things look like he is being heroic. And in fairness to him, he has done a lot of good things. And I don't want to paint him with a, a, a kind of an easy brush. He's not a villain. Uh, he has exercised a degree of what he would call corporate social responsibility. And he's tried to get the bank to do some very good things in Detroit and some other cities. Uh, but if you look just slightly behind the surface, if you just look behind the curtain a little bit, what you see is that he is not, as he describes himself, a patriot first. He is the president and CEO of the biggest bank first. And his mm. major accomplishment and his major obligation uh, is to pump up bank shares uh, as high as they possibly can be. And so much of what he says rhetorically is belied what the bank, uh, belied by what he actually does and the bank, J.P. Morgan Chase has actually done. Uh, the system that he is running is a system that has increasingly been there for the very wealthy, the very privileged, the very powerful. But it's a system that increasingly has abandoned everybody else. And in this coronavirus epidemic, this terrible nightmare, uh, we see once again the forces of Wall Street and corporate America getting a huge bailout while the typical American gets what, $1,200 one-time payment? 
Uh, we see them uh, getting uh, tax breaks inside that bill. I don't know how many people watching this have actually read that bill. I don't recommend it unless you have very, uh, tremendous problems getting to sleep at night. But it's a very big piece of legislation. Buried inside that piece of legislation are, are some tax breaks. It's not surprising uh, for some big banks, for real estate investors, and for others. Uh, again, this is how the system works, even in a time of crisis. And yeah. finally, let me just say that although Jamie Dimon hasn't sounded it, uh, other big bank presidents and CEOs recently have said, we need to get back to work as soon as possible. Uh, what they're really saying, I believe, is we need to get the stock market back as soon as possible, because in America, in our system, the top 1%, the richest 1%, owns more than 50% of the entire stock market. Uh, they are not thinking about this as a public health crisis. They're not thinking about this in terms of all the frontline workers who are every day, including our hospital workers, uh, subject to real risk and real possibility of getting this virus. What they're thinking about and thinking about the society as is an economy that is dominated by a stock market which for the most part has really nothing to do with most people's real interests or what most people need. Uh, I could go on and on, and, and, and you know that I could go on. No, but on. I, I think that's very helpful. And, I, and I, one of the things I, you know, I think you have to go to the book to understand this, but one of the things, having read Bob's books of the past, one of the things that really makes this very unusual as a book, is just a matter of literary form, frankly, um, is that this book contains a kind of hip hop beef within a political art, a political economy argument, right? So you alternate between these like very smart, uh, well-argued, evidence-based, statistic, but also narratively filled passages about what happened to us writ large. And then you keep going back to Jamie Dimon. And it's just the most brilliant thing because Jamie Dimon embodies this system, as you just laid out. And I, one of the things that's just really satisfying about this book for all of you is it, Jamie Dimon personifies this in a way, and you really bring it to life through him. So, so come for the economics and the politics, but stay for the, uh, the hip hop beef uh, created between Bob and Jamie. Um, I, I want to ask you something about, to explain the thesis of this book to everybody watching in the following way. Uh, you know, the writer Michael Lewis, fellow Berkeley uh, denizen, um, has this line about writers are people who feel that the world has fundamentally misperceived something, and they try to help the world reperceive that same thing a little differently, the way they see it. Um, can you, I mean, I, I think a lot of people tuning in at this hour to watch you are, let's assume they're not Jamie Dimon. Let's assume they're sympathetic broadly to your politics, uh, they may have voted for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or were planning to, they may be progressives. Um, if you think about that relatively sympathetic group for you, what do you think you were trying to say or explain in this book about how the system works that would be surprising even to them? Uh, I, I think that the, the major point is that one of the reasons that the Jamie Dimon's of the world, the oligarchy, stays in power, in fact, continues to increase power and wealth, uh, is that they have sold Americans on a series of mythologies, a series of uh, uh, basically uh, justifications for their wealth and power that have no basis in fact and have no basis in the reality that most people live in. And it is vitally important that we understand how they are using these mythologies and also what they, in league with people like Donald Trump, are doing to entrench their power and their wealth. For example, uh, just one of many, uh, the idea of a free market. Uh, this is something that has driven me crazy for about 40 years. It solves all problems, right? But, the, but the, the fact of the matter is you cannot have a market without government. It's not a choice between the free market and government. Government sets the rules of the market. Government decides 
the, even the fundamentals, what is going to be traded? What is property? How do you uh, repay debts? What is bankruptcy? What are, what they, they, when I, every time I've been in government, I've been amazed at the ability of particularly conservatives to sell the notion that there is a fundamental choice here between government and market, when in fact the real issue is not government or market. The real issue is who has the most influence over the people who in government are setting the rules of the market. And so mm -hmm. what you see increasingly is that the Jamie Dimons of the world have more and more influence over what the rules of the market are going to be. But they hide behind the notion that the market is neutral, that the market is somehow in the state of nature, that somehow government intrudes on the market. Uh, and that language of government intruding on the market is even found in, uh, in the academy, in, in economics courses, in political science courses. It is absolutely absurd. Uh, it is getting in the way of clear thought. Uh, on, on another one that is very, very important to understand uh, is the mythology of corporate social responsibility. Uh, that somehow corporations are charitable, are through the, the goodness of their collective hearts. Uh, Jamie Dimon and other corporations like J.P. Morgan Chase are doing wonderful things for America. And if you only got out of the way, uh, they would do even more. Uh, the fact of the matter is that is all public relations. They do not and cannot and will not do anything that fundamentally sacrifices shareholder returns. Uh, that, that they can't and will not make their corporations into slush funds, as it were, for good causes. Uh, it is all 100% public relations, uh, and it serves as a kind of a bulwark against criticism, and they use it again and again and again uh, to avoid showing what they are actually doing behind the scenes. And one Can we talk about one specific example of that? So the, the business roundtable that you mentioned, this umbrella, it, it's, it's the corporation of all the corporations in a way. It, it speaks for big companies in America. Jamie Dimon, as you said, runs this organization. And this organization was so proud of itself uh, last year, last uh, August, when it made a statement that was immediately billed as historic, put on the front page of the New York Times, just the press release was put on the front page of the New York Times. The business roundtable representing 180 some companies in America, led by uh, Jamie Dimon, says the purpose of a corporation is no longer just to make money for share shareholders, it's to take care of society and do all this stuff. And I actually got my phone call from Jamie Dimon after I made critical comments in that New York Times article in the end, and he called me also. He calls a lot of people. Um, and what was really interesting is when he called me, say that again? No, I was just going to say that, that uh, people listening and viewing this uh, say critical things about Jamie Dimon, and Jamie might call you too. I mean, this, this could yes. be- Yes, and then I ask him for money. A whole new occupation, a whole new, a whole new way of being, yes. being called so, by- so, so he and I get into this, Argument. I mean, and to be fair, unlike a lot of people like him, he was interested in having it out. We had it out. Unlike a lot of people like him, he did not say it was off the record, uh, which means it's on the record. And so we had a on the record conversation that I later shared publicly. Um, and we got to many different impasses. But one of them was I said, okay, this statement is great. People should treat workers well. Great. People should not avoid taxes. Fantastic. People should, you know, various other good things for the environment and so on and so forth. And all I see is a press release claiming that you now think those things are the right thing to do, which is reminds me of every New Year's resolution that I have ever, you know, failed at, which is all of them. Um, so why don't you start lobbying in Washington for a law? that would actually make it mandatory for you to treat workers in this supposedly better way? Why didn't you start lobbying in Washington for a carbon tax that would actually make it the law to take care of the environment in this way? And as soon as you say that, that's when you discover the, the limits of Jamie Dimon, right? And suddenly it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I wonder if you could just talk yeah, about the difference between voluntary corporate virtue and the 
well, they don't want to actually get into politics for anything other than the purpose of enlarging their own wealth and the wealth of their shareholders. Uh, in fact, they view uh, entering into politics to protect workers or to do anything else that they say they aspire to. And by the way, uh, this uh, set of uh, public relations statements that came, the business roundtable came out with uh, last August, uh, it was not like a New Year's resolution. There was no real aspiration there. It was not as if they said, gee, it would be nice to really, really want to do this. I, I just hope we can, we can, we can try to do this. No, because, because weeks later, just weeks later, uh, Amazon, uh, one of the signers of this uh, declaration, uh, decided that it would remove health care for all its part-time workers at its uh, at, 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 at several of its major subsidiaries. Uh, and uh, just four weeks later, Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, decided that no, uh, even though General Motors was making a lot of money, General Motors would not give any more increase in wages to its workers, precipitating the longest strike in modern labor history last fall. I mean, it sounds like, feels like it was years ago. It was just last fall. Uh, and, and you go down or look at, for example, Boeing, another signer of this statement. Uh, Boeing, uh, it turns out, as it was signing the statement, it was trying to cover up uh, some defects in the software of its new uh, its newest aircraft, which resulted in the deaths of, of, of hundreds of people. So if you look at signer by signer, corporation by corporation, uh, the business roundtable last August, that statement of principle that they actually owed society some particular set of, uh, of, of obligations and responsibilities was completely and utterly bogus. Uh, it was really, and, and it has to be understood, not as an aspiration, but as an attempt to actually deflect public attention from what was they were really doing at the time. Uh, and uh, since then, they have continued to do it. I mean, this business. Uh, let's 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 look at the coronavirus bill. Uh, I mean, that bill. The, the, who was lobbying wildly uh, for five hundred billion dollars? Well, it was Boeing. Boeing was at the head of the list of the same company that signed the business roundtable statement last August, that it really had responsibilities to everybody. These companies have been using their tax benefits that they got out of the December 2017 big tax bill. Remember, all of them said, Jamie Dimon said, well, if we get this big tax of relief, we're going to give more money to our workers. We're going to invest for the long term. They did not. They used all of the tax savings, 95% of the tax savings, to buy back their shares of stock for the benefit of their top executives and the benefit of their major investors. Almost nothing, literally nothing, trickled down to workers. Uh, it's, you know, we, we can go back to the bank bailouts of 2000. I think it's such an important example of how the virus time has been a time when, although it's an exceptional time in so many ways and a time that is unlike any other time in our lifetimes, it is not an aberration. It is, it is not a departure from the laws that you describe, the, the kind of laws of nature that you describe um, in this book. It is a doubling down of all of that. All of these things are happening in full force in this time. Um, I want to I want to switch a little bit to to politics because although it's easy to forget right now, we are in an election year. Um, you know, one of the unexpected honors of my life was when I blurbed your book, I found my blurb sandwiched uh, between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. So, you know, basically made me feel like I was like almost a senator, like close, um, pretty close. Uh, you're good friends with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, I think you respect both of them. I think they both respect you or at least blurbed your book. Um, what do you, can you describe what you thought the fundamental difference between the two of them that they represented for the American people as a choice between them? And then what do you think happened? I mean, her rise and fall, Bernie's you know, moment where we actually thought that this might happen and then his seeming fall behind Biden. What do you think of the path they each represented and what happened to their rises and falls? Uh, well, they followed both a, a similar path in terms of rising and falling, Elizabeth Warren before Bernie. Uh, but in terms of policies, uh, they were almost identical. I mean, there was very little light between them uh, on certain things like a wealth tax 
Uh, Bernie was a little bit more radical, so-called, than Elizabeth, but she was, I mean, she put the wealth tax on uh, the public dinner table, as it were. Uh, Bernie obviously has been pushing Medicare for all, uh, a single payer system since 2016. Elizabeth Warren uh, initially bought onto that. Uh, so it, it, issue by issue, they were almost identical. Uh, the only difference has to do with uh, the way in which they presented themselves. Bernie uh, talked about himself and continues to talk about himself as a democratic socialist. Uh, and Elizabeth Warren uh, talks about herself as a capitalist. Uh, these are stylistic differences. Uh, nobody knows the difference between uh, Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism and Elizabeth Warren capitalism. A few people have attempted to distinguish the two and, and it's mostly bullshit, quite frankly. Uh, but here's the interesting question and you raise the interesting, interesting question, what happened to them? Why did Elizabeth Warren reach her apex in October and then what knocked her off? Well, what happened was that she was pushing Medicare for all. She said nobody had to pay more taxes except people at the very top in terms of the wealth tax. Bernie was not prepared to go that far, or at least he was not prepared to say what she did. He wanted to say that everybody's taxes would go up some, but everybody would would actually benefit more from having a Medicare for all system. No, she wanted to very clearly put the onus of the tax burden on the people at the top. And then what happened was that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and a lot of pundits uh, for these outlets, uh, they all jumped on her, they pounded on her. I mean, it was, a, it was kind of a free for all. They said, well, you have to cost out exactly how you're gonna pay for your Medicare for all. I mean, as if it was a piece of detailed legislation uh, before Congress. Uh, you know, I've never seen a, a candidate have to account for almost every dollar. Uh, well, she fell for it, unfortunately. Uh, she succumbed to the seduction of being a policy wonk, and she actually did try to justify where every dollar was coming from, and she did a pretty good job. But the minute she did that, uh, the minute she showed that she would play that kind of game in that kind of sandbox, her public support started to drop because the public said to itself, as many of the pundits did, well, you are just too radical. You are too much of a, you don't call yourself a socialist, but you're too far out there. Uh, we're gonna look for somebody else. Now, her decline corresponded with Bernie Sanders' ascent, because at that point in October, he was just beginning to come up. He continued to rise. And then when it looked like he was actually the number one candidate, like Elizabeth Warren had been in, in October, what happened to him? Well, the major media outlets, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and all of the pundits, and I wanna add the major networks and the major, uh, the major you know, CNN and the cable news broadcasters, all of them started piling on him. And all you heard was he's a socialist, he's scary, uh, he's going to take the country in places we don't want to be, uh, he's going to be, he's going to be sort of the left equivalent of Donald Trump. And that drumbeat was louder than it even was in 2016. And so Bernie began to fall. And the minute Joe Biden showed any energy at all in South Carolina, uh, in, it seems an eternity ago, but it was at the South Carolina primary, uh, just before Super Tuesday, then the establishment all gathered around Joe Biden. And when I use the term establishment, I want to be very clear about what I'm talking about. I don't mean a conspiracy, uh, and I don't mean just the wealthiest people in America. I mean the people who are either working for the wealthiest people in America, indirectly or directly, or the people who want to be thought of as reasonable, quote unquote, by the establishment, by the wealthiest people in America, by the people who they, they, they form their social circle, uh, the people who are considered to be uh, the moderate, moderate left, or uh, in some cases, the moderate right. Uh, the establishment has its own code of ethics, its own way of thinking, its own approach. 
And by and large, these are people who are very honest, who are, they, these are not conspiratorial people, uh, but they really do watch what each other thinks and they want to be thought of well by the people with power and the people with wealth. Can, and so can, you get the ask you of telling prophecy. I, I wanna, so I agree with everything you said about, you know, um, what happened both to, to Senators Warren and Sanders. And I think, you know, as, as, uh, as someone who was on MSNBC talking about both phenomena, particularly the Sanders one, I felt viscerally that sense of people who are kind of mentally, but also materially unwilling to fathom the possibility that these movements actually might have purchase with people when they actually did have tremendous purchase with people. But I want to flip it around a little bit and ask you about, uh, you know, when you lose, you often lose because of a combination of what the other, the outside world's done to you and your own shortcomings or ways you could have been more effective. And one of the things that strikes me about not just these two candidates, but also down ballot candidates with similar uh, sets of ideas is that it seems to me these kinds of progressive policies of universal health care, of a wealth tax, um, of more secure employment have a tremendous amount of resonance in the public. They have a way more resonance with every passing day that people are screwed over by their absence. Um, and yet it seems to me when you get to the political sale, there is in some of the candidates representing this set of ideas at various levels up and down the ballot, um, it, it, a, a kind of failure to touch the emotional registers of people that are such an important part of politics and that a lot of the bad guys in politics understand very well. Like Donald Trump probably can't read, but he understands how to play on people's emotional registers. You know, Joe Biden, I think, does not have any serious ideas for how to change America, but he's, he's reasonably good at, you know, some of that kind of emotional stuff, the hand-to-hand -hand emotional combat, sometimes a little too much hand-to-hand, -hand, that, that is, is an effective tool in politics. And when I looked at both the Sanders and Warren campaigns and, and others, it sometimes seems to me if these, if these movements are gonna succeed, there's gonna need to be a, a communications revolution to go with the political revolution, invoking deep patriotic themes that really resonate people, with people, speaking to Pennsylvania and Michigan and all those places in a way that does not scare them off about socialism. Can you talk about how these ideas can be better communicated to people for whom they would do so much good? Uh, well, I think that Bernie and Elizabeth did a very good job of communicating overall. Um, uh, let me just go, answer your question by um, giving you a, 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 a look at what, what I saw in 2016. And I was out there researching this book, doing some initial research uh, on the system. Uh, in, uh, actually it was 2015, it was just the beginning of the 2016 election cycle. I was out in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Minnesota and uh, the Rust Belt, also North Carolina in Missouri. Uh, and I was conducting kind of a free floating focus group, asking people about their experiences and uh, their jobs and uh, their feelings about the country and about the American dream, uh, but also invariably politics entered into it. And I started asking them, now this was the fall of 2015. I started asking them, well, who is it out there politically who you find most attractive, who is speaking to you in terms of where you are? Uh, not where the politics uh, should be, and, but, but where you are, who's, who's talking to you? And what I found again and again, uh, farmers in Missouri and small business people in North Carolina and, and, and truckers in Michigan and, uh, and, and labor union people in Minnesota, they all said back to me, well, there are two people that we find very attractive uh, that are speaking to us. And I said, oh, great, who are those people? And again and again, Anand, those people were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Now, the first time I heard those two men talked about in the same sentence, I said, well, this is impossible. I mean, we must be on different worlds. I mean, th th these two people that cannot exist in your mind uh, in, the same, in the same phrase. Uh, but it turned out that what these people, average Americans, 
uh, were, who were all, you know, they were all struggling, they were working hard, they were, they were trying to do two or three jobs, many of them. What they were telling me was that they wanted somebody who really understood them. They were feeling increasingly angry about the system. They were feeling increasingly as if the game was rigged against them. Uh, and these were the two people, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who were willing to talk about the game being rigged. Now, we know now, obviously, Donald Trump was a, uh, you know, was in disguise. I mean, he was, he was, he was representing, in fact, uh, the oligarchy against everybody else. I mean, I mean he, he gave them the biggest tax cut uh, that anybody's ever received. He's, he, he gave them the bailouts. He's given them all the regulatory rollbacks they ever wanted. But to these people out there in America, uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders resonated. I believe in 2020 uh, that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders did resonate. I think the real problem was the vehicles by which Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren had to, had to reach individual people. Uh, you see, social media, for all its strengths, really doesn't connect people the way that maybe it will someday. Uh, Bernie and Elizabeth still had to use the media, still had to rely on the major establishment media. And MSNBC, for example, I mean, I appear on MSNBC quite often. I think very well of a lot of the people on MSNBC. But have you ever seen a, a, a network, uh, quite, apart, quite apart from whether it's supposed to be on the left or right or center, have you ever seen a network come down as hard on any candidate as MSNBC came down on Bernie Sanders? I, I mean, right. that's where a lot of progressives get their news, MSNBC. Uh, and and that that trembling that Bernie Sanders took and it continues to take from MSNBC uh, really was a problem. Uh, and uh, so you I, just, I, I want to ask you two very uh, quick lightning rod questions, uh, lightning round questions, lightning rod also, um, and then we're gonna then I'm gonna ask you questions that I've just received from the crowd um, from this from this great audience. Um, the, the the lightning round questions. Is America an oligarchy, yes or no, right now? Yes, it is. Uh, and oligarchy is a great old Greek word. It means where, uh, you know, a society in which uh, the wealth and the power are in the hands of a very few, relatively few people. It is an oligarchy. Absolutely. Um, should we have billionaires? And what is the highest level of percentage wealth tax that you would be comfortable with? Uh, no, we shouldn't have billionaires, not because billionaires are bad people, but because the system, if it were actually working right, would not create billionaires. Uh, in other words, if you look at the micro system, you look at the building blocks of the system, you look at how the system is organized, the reason you get to be a billionaire is either uh, because of tax laws, uh, allow you to inherit huge amounts from your parents, uh, which tax laws never used to quite allow in the United States, certainly the first part of the 20th century, or because uh, you've got patent and trademark and intellectual property laws that allow you to maintain intellectual property rights far beyond what they used to be maintained, or because you've got insider trading information that allow you, and, and the insider trading securities laws never used to allow you to use the insider, insider information to the extent that you can now use them. I could go on a long list, Anand, of ways in which the system has been altered over the years by people with a great deal of wealth and power so that they can become billionaires. It's not a matter of their talents. It's a matter of how the system is organized to allow billionaires. And if we had a system that is anywhere near the system we had, and I don't want to express, I don't want to suggest that the system of the 50s and 60s and 70s was a golden age. It wasn't in many respects, obviously. But even there, we had a growing middle class, growing equality, less and less tolerance for corruption. In those years, we didn't have the billionaires because we had a system that was organized differently. Um, so we're going to go to questions from, from all of you now. Uh, the first one is from Vishal. Um, 
A theme touched upon in the excellent books both of you have written, oh, that's very nice, Michelle, is the fallacy of billionaire philanthropy as a solution to systemic problems. Could you speak to how the current coronavirus crisis exposes and exemplifies this fallacy? Uh, yeah, uh, Vishal, uh, I mean, all around us, we see uh, companies that are, on the one hand, they are, uh, they are saying, okay, well, we're, we're producing masks and uh, we'll, we'll produce ventilators and, and we will do, uh, we'll, pro we'll provide help to people in need uh, there was a there was a big company was was doing something for some homeless, but these are the same companies uh, that are treating their own workers badly, not giving any sick leave or giving no paid sick leave, or or Amazon, for example, uh, that gives two weeks of paid sick leave only if you've already taken the coronavirus test and tested positive. I mean, these are companies that actually, if you look at how they operate, are operating in the most irresponsible way toward people who they really should be responsible. The philanthropy is just a, a thin guise for what they are really all about. Um, next question is from, you know, I agree with that. Ra next question is from um, Randy. What is the number one thing we can all do to harness and advance the spirit of needed change coming from this pandemic? Uh, Randy, my hope, uh, and now it could be a, a kind of silly and overly optimistic aspiration, but my hope is that just like the Depression in World War II, uh, created a sense of solidarity that we had not had before. A uh, solidarity in the sense we're all in the same boat. We really are dependent on each other. And what happens to one person inevitably affects what happens to another. Uh, maybe the pandemic will enable more of us to see that such things as a minimum basic income or a Medicare for all are critical for the future. We can afford them. Uh, they would actually be cheaper than uh, constantly trying to deal with the, the problems that come from not having a, uh, a, a kind of uh, a social safety net that is, that is, that is, that is secure or a, a healthcare system that works. I mean, you can't come out of this pandemic and say uh, America has uh, a public health system. I mean, we don't. Uh, you can't come out of this pandemic and say, uh, we take care of our own. Uh, we don't. And yet we're the richest country in the history of the world. The fact we can't is a disgrace to all of us. Hopefully we understand that at some deep level uh, once this is all over. Uh, this next question is from Vebov. Um, I think you both talk about government slash structural solutions to problems, rather than depending on the whims of billionaire philanthropy. What are some examples of a successful government-led solution or action that we should refer to as counterexamples to the status quo? Well, there are many. I mean, look at Social Security. Uh, look at Medicare. Uh, look at uh, what we have accomplished so far. I mean, it's still a beginning, uh, but the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I mean, look at the ways in which this country, when it is concerned about national defense, rallies around. I mean, the National Defense Production Act, the Defense Production Act, uh, gives Trump uh, easily all of the authority he needs to uh, demand that the private sector do far more than it's doing right now. Uh, but the Defense Department is the only department that's been using the Defense Production Act, uh, and it's used it about, what, a, about 300,000 times uh, since Donald Trump was elected. And yet, when it comes to public health, he doesn't use it. Uh, you know, we do have the capacity and we have utilized the capacity to do, do a lot of things for the country. Uh, for the nation in the sense, in the best sense of for all of us. Uh, but we've got to get back to that. Uh, and, uh, and we can, I believe we can. Uh, one other thought on the same line, on, and then that is that, you know, for the last 20 or 30 years, government uh, has not functioned terribly well in many respects. And people say, well, that's too bad, or we just have a bad government, or George W. Bush got us into the Iraqi war, and da 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 da. da. And we have a lot of complaints and a lot of, a lot of doubts about government's capacity. But this pandemic 
is different in the sense that it's not just a matter of being inconvenienced or being sort of pissed off about what government does. This is a matter of life and death. Government's failures over the last several months have literally meant more people are dying than would otherwise die. That brute fact is going to seep into the public consciousness if it already hasn't. And so a good and effective government led by good and effective people is literally a matter of life and death. Um, the next question is from Evan. Uh, given that Joe Biden seems to be our presumptive nominee, what can we do to push him and his administration in a more progressive direction? You know something about uh, being on the inside, trying to push a centrist administration in a more progressive direction. Uh, yes, and, and I, you know, for five years, I was in Bill Clinton's administration in the cabinet, and I, uh, you know, I've never been so frustrated and angry in my whole life. I mean, I'd sit there with uh, these representatives from Wall Street. Basically, they were, you know, the represent they were Wall Street representatives uh, in the cabinet, and they would they were good people, but they had this view, this Jamie Dimon view of how the system should be working. And it was, you know, it was retching. I mean, it, it made me um, so, not cynical, but so fundamental, fundamentally uh, uh, outraged, uh, morally outraged. Why do you say they're good people when they have reason to know that they're ideas and values cause so much destruction for so many people? Because I don't think they do understand how bad their, the bad consequences of what they're doing. I think Jamie Dimon, and I, you know, in, in the course of writing the book, I did a lot of research. I, I, I read everything I could possibly read about Jamie Dimon. I talked to people who knew Jamie Dimon. Um, All right. I, my conclusion is that he is not a bad man. He is, he is, he is, he is draped. He is, he is drenched in self-delusion. Uh, he doesn't understand how he has basically screwed up the system and made it more difficult uh, for the system to function. Uh, but back to the question, uh, what can we do about, about Joe Biden? I think the, ba the basic argument with Joe Biden is that the only way he can win in November is if he has young people and progressives behind him. And the only way he's gonna have young people and progressives behind him is if he starts acting and sounding more like a progressive and has a little bit of courage uh, and is willing to stick his neck out a little bit, uh, like Medicare for all. I mean, I think uh, today, this morning, uh, he said, no, he's still against Medicare for all. Well, you know, I, I respect if that's his view. This is such a great opening for him to say, I was against it, but now I've changed my mind because a big enough thing has happened that, that you, could, you could say you've changed your mind without, without seeming like a, like a flake. Exactly, precisely. He could say, and I hope he does, I hope he has smart people advising him who are telling this. If he doesn't do this, if he doesn't at least embrace some of the energy and some of the ideas of the progressive movement, He's not going to get the votes. He's not going to get the turnout. He's not going to get young people. Uh, and we're going to get four more years of Donald Trump. Um, next question from Doug. The power grabs uh, happen out of the public eye. I think Doug is referring maybe to what happens in general, but also very much what is happening now. How do we best convince friendly audiences what is happening? Um, and, and then how do you convince unfriendly audiences? And I'd ask you to emphasize that part in particular. Is there a way in which this critique of the system that you lay out in the book, it, it would seem that some of this corruption, crony capitalism, et cetera, actually does offend some conservatives, uh, some right-wing people, if you had um, the ability to speak to them in a certain way. How would you do that? Well, I think it does offend a lot of conservatives. Uh, and as I was saying, in, in 2015, when I was going around the country, uh, many of the people I talked with were described themselves as conservatives or Republicans. Uh, but when I talked about crony capitalism or corporate welfare or corruption or the amount of money that big corporations were inundating the system with uh, in terms of getting political outcomes they wanted, uh, these people were offended. Were, they were as offended as I am 
and was offended. And so I think it is possible to create a coalition of the bottom 90% by income and by wealth who are truly offended at what the oligarchy is doing. One of the strategies the oligarchy has used is divide and conquer create this notion that if you're on the left and on the right, you must be in, in you must hate each other. Uh, and if you are black or if you're white or if you're a Native American or if you're, if you're born here, if you're born someplace else, all of this uh, sort of uh, divi divisiveness, it actually helps the oligarchy because it takes attention off of what they are doing to accumulate ever more wealth and power. And we've got to have leaders who are willing to call them on it. Uh, next question is from Samantha. How do you feel about the fact that our progressive heroes in Congress voted for this last stimulus? It is heartbreaking for me. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at least demonstrated some fury with the shame speech, but I feel like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders let us down. Your thoughts? Well, I think that there are certain things in the in the bill, like the unemployment insurance, 600 dollars a week more than unemployment in your state provided you in terms of unemployment benefits, a plus unemployment insurance for gig workers and contract workers. That is a good thing. Uh, do you know, it's one of the, it's one of the oldest conundrums in the book. Uh, do you let the perfect be the enemy of the better? Uh, do you allow uh, these big corporations to get bailed out uh, and people to get even richer uh, but at the same time, uh, do, you, do you turn your back in terms of trying to avoid that on the real needs of real people who might otherwise get unemployment insurance or small businesses that might get a forgivable loan? Uh, you know, I think the Democrats, particularly Nancy Pelosi and the House Democrats, tried their best uh, to dilute what was a total corporate giveaway in the Senate Republican bill. They, you know, would I have voted for this? Uh, probably holding my nose, given that people are in such dire need. Uh, but that only goes back to the first principle that we're talking about. If people are not mobilized and organized, if they don't know what they need, if they don't know what's happening behind the scenes, as Doug asked just a moment ago, uh, then they are going to believe Donald Trump, or they're going to believe uh, what, they, what they see or read in the New York Times, uh, even though it may actually be the result of corporate public relations. Uh, so back to Doug's question, which is, how do you reveal what is really happening behind the scenes? This is where great reporting, this is your domain. This is where you've got to have investigative reporters who have the means to show the public reality. You know, the Ida, the Ida Tarbells of the 21st century, uh, the people who are really going to pull back the curtain and show how much corruption and inequality we now have. Uh, and, uh, and I think the public, right or left, including many people on the right, would be utterly disgusted. The, the last question just reminded me something I wanted to ask you earlier. What do you make of, uh, quick answer to this one, what do you make of AOC as a, as a kind of next generation figure for some of these ideas we've been talking about? I love her. I think she is dynamite. Uh, and her energy, I mean, the, first of all, the fact that she was a bartender, the fact that she comes from, you know, humble surroundings, that she, and young people uh, can identify with her. I think that she's the next generation of American leadership and American politicians. And every time I start getting a little bit down, I think of people like her and young people, uh, you know, the, 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 the kids who survived gun violence, uh, the, the other people who are taking leadership positions in this country now uh, who represent the best of the future. And I feel, I feel better about where we are and who we are and where we're going. And the last thing I want to ask you, I'm going to steal the privilege to, to ask my own final question. Um, as someone who has studied it, it, and written about in so many of your books, economic and political history, um, you know very well that crises like the one we're in have very divergent outcomes historically. Sometimes they lead to total consolidations of power. Sometimes they shatter power in a way that 
seemed unimaginable five years earlier. Um, sometimes crises like these lead to authoritarianism. Sometimes they completely crash a system like feudalism or colonialism or something like that. Um, sometimes you have the shock doctrine effect to quote Naomi Klein. Sometimes you have the triangle shirtwaist factory where one incident triggers uh, a whole wave of, of labor protections. Um, what can people watching this um, do to tilt the odds in favor of this crisis tending in that creative, progressive, egalitarian direction rather than the reverse? Uh, well, the first and most important thing they have to do right now is protect themselves and their loved ones from this virus. Uh, and the second thing they need to do is make sure that the next piece of legislation coming out of Congress, which is already being formulated as we speak right now, uh, make sure that it is focused on helping people rather than big corporations. The third thing that they can do and must do, uh, especially coming out of this crisis, and I'm assuming that we begin to come out of this in the summer, maybe June or maybe July, uh, is focused like a laser on the November elections, not just the presidential election, but also the Senate and the House and the state uh, and even the local elections and become even more activist, even more mobilized, even more committed to progressive change. Because Anand, you're absolutely right. We see the forces of authoritarianism as, emblem, as, as epitomized by Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump, if he gets a second term, is going to do everything he can to consolidate executive power and all power around him. Uh, it could be, and I don't want to sound unnecessarily alarmist, but it could be the end of democracy as we know it. Uh, but I don't think that's nearly in the cards. I think it's amazing how little his popularity has increased in a crisis and a national emergency. Normally, uh, you know, when you have whoever the national leader is, George W. Bush, after 9-11, his popularity went up 30 percent. Uh, Donald Trump has gone up just maybe two percentage points. Uh, no, he is still very vulnerable. And we've got to make sure, absolutely sure, that from Trump on down, we have people like AOC, who understand what average people are going through, what the poor are going through, what this nation can afford, and what this nation must do. Um, Robert Reich, I want to thank you so much for your um, service to the country, for your ideas, for your writing. Um, you have already written more books than you know most writers alive have managed to pull off. It's an extraordinary list, and this one is fantastic. Hold up the book cover for us so we can see it. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the the, the I'm not only gonna hold up the book cover. Uh, I'm not only gonna hold up the book cover. Thank you very much for that wonderful plug, Adon. And let me say, uh, I I want to return the compliment because I just love your writing. As I said at the start of this, uh, I'm gonna turn the book over. Uh, and I'm going to say that on the back of the book, there is the most extraordinary blurb uh, from the man who is on this, uh, this call with me. Uh, and you notice that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, their wonderful blurbs never made right. it. There's only one blurb that made it yes. to the back of this book, and that is yours. One of my great achievements. And <laughs> It's one of my great achievements. I want to, I want to thank you for the highest moments. <laughs> and, and I just want to say this is a moment um, when, if you um, do have a little bit of time, this is a good time to read books. This is an excellent book to read. Um, the Greenlight Bookstore is is an extraordinary bookstore in Brooklyn, New York, at the very epicenter of this. Um, tragedy and this crisis, this crisis that is a health crisis and a political crisis and an economic crisis all rolled into one. Um, it's really important to me uh, and, to, and, to, and to Bob and to all of us, I think, that there be books and bookstores at the end of it. So if you can, um, get a copy of Bob, Bob's book from the Greenlight Bookstore online. They'll ship it to you. Uh, if you're able, you're lucky in this time, 
get a second book of someone else by someone else, maybe about dinosaur for your kids or something else, um, and, and support books and bookstores in this moment, because we're gonna need them more than ever as we seek to rebuild uh, the country after this. Thank you all for, for being part of this, for sticking with us the whole way through. Thank you, Bob. Um, good night and good luck. And be safe, everyone. <laughs>